previously on Making a Mug Club. I wish I could say that none of us saw this coming, but all of us for sure did. We knew it was in the cards for a lot of people. We'd already been demonetized quite a bit. He demonetizes his own videos to sell more mugs. In the era of deplatforming, it's becoming harder to know who to trust. Before he completely fabricated a conspiracy, I thought Owen Benjamin was a friend. So I couldn't make sense of why he would spread what is clearly a lie. Because as anyone would tell you who works with me, I'm an amazing person. Who, Steven? Yeah, he's all right. So why would Owen lie like that? It didn't make sense. Furthermore, it's well known that he has the attention span of a Pomeranian, so he couldn't have woven this tapestry of lies alone. But who else on the right would want to take down Mug Club? It was time to look at motive. Right away, the standout suspect was David Rubin, who has knowingly harbored ill will against my Mug Club and its tremendous success for a long time. Catastrophic results? We can't prove that yet. People don't agree on that. So you, you, you want to wait? You want to wait till Miami is? Uh, Miami's already know. supposed to be gone, Dave. Anyone who watched an inconvenient to most people, it would seem odd that David, a gay guy, would be so angry. But few people know that David Rubin hides a far more sinister secret. It's a well-known fact that David Rubin is a homosexual a disease which afflicts less than 3% of the population, causing him to have unnatural sexual urges toward other men. It was a large part of his brand. For David Rubin, though not as big or successful as Mug Club, being gay was big business. But what if he wasn't telling the truth? What if gay David Rubin was hiding something? A rudimentary search of public records revealed that David Rubin is in fact married to a man and is indeed a practicing homosexual. But there's something else that's been bothering me. Something that doesn't add up. Maybe I've been looking in the wrong place all along. No, Dave Rubin is definitely gay. Like, no conspiracy. Definitely really, really gay. Are those real? What? Are those real? It's a valid question. What the hell is wrong with you? I this guy on this show is a mistake. I'm, you're an what? I don't... I, I don't... I, oh! you on the show today. Back in studio was here yesterday in third chair is Lauren Southern. Lauren underscore Southern. How are you? I'm good. Wrong pronouns again. Remember, legally oh, a man. This is true. So you don't have to be uncomfortable anymore. What pronoun do we use for no someone cooties. who hits the microphone? <laughs> Idiot. <laughs> <It's> Boss. Just... <laughs> <laughs> Let's go with Z. And I pre Ye yesterday, Lauren, for those who missed one of my members, came in in a be beautiful dress yeah. and we all felt horrible. And so we shamed her right away and said, yeah. dress down. Please. Yeah. So we appreciate Much it. Cozy. We were in like PJs. Yes, exactly. I know. By the way, I know we're going to have Tommy Robinson on the show. Uh, we don't have him on, for obvious oh. reasons. The guy has a lot going on, but we we do have Karen's Drawn. Boom. Yeah. Nice. We do have Stefan Molyneux. There Boom. We also have Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and Samantha B. Him again? Yeah. Not exactly. Yeah. Uh, producing.
thing actually doing a really good job this week is quarter black Garrett. You are in fact a quarter black. That's right. Yeah, I am. I appreciate it. Thank Show you. the fans that they uh, can know. Oh, trust yeah, you. That's I mean, terrible. We're going to lose the, the entire black audience. It's all four <laughs> percent. And uh, what's the wine of the day, uh, Adji Morgan Jr.? Had, had to bring a, an extra large bottle for you, heavy drinkers. This is uh, Long Shadows Pirouette. Long Shadows Pirouette. Why is it an extra large bottle? Why do they because sell it in that because format? When it comes to wine size, really does. Matter. I feel like it's something that I would see on Pinterest from a mom that I don't like. Wait, no, this is like, really good. I am only having my one serving of wine a day, and they have the giant <laughs> the glass. You know, yeah. Yeah. Mommy needs her special juice. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I ate fruit for dinner. <laughs> it's like, ah, yeah. Hopefully, your kids have a pool without a fence. And hopefully, you're buying wine from me. Uh, by the way, question of the day: We're going to be talking quite a bit about Me Too and some of the latest frauds yeah. involved thereof. Uh, a few months into this now, we've seen a shift. You notice a shift in the temperature, a change in the temperature toward yeah. the movement. Yeah. So how do you balance being supportive of the victims, of course, actual victims, while not automatically throwing anyone who's ever been accused uh, under the bus? No questions asked. Let me know. Let us know. We'll be talking about it. And I think we'll be talking about it with, uh, with uh, Karen Strawn. Actually, Lauren will be fill-in hosting for me with Karen yes. Strawn. Yes. Just because I can. <laughs> uh, leading the news, though, you'll love this, Lauren. I have no idea why, is a new study on ecosexuality. Did you know that was a thing? Mm. So, yeah, it's I having... I didn't want to know that was a thing. <laughs> well, it's having I feel sex, like you're going to tell me anyway. I am. With the earth. Yeah. The earth, taking the earth as a lover, raises a number of legitimate concerns regarding non-human consent as well as sexuality. This comes from Sage Journal. Good Lord. Um, <laughs> seems like it would. It seems like this would raise a lot of questions. I've heard of objectum sexuals, like that lady who married the Wait, Eiffel what? Tower. Yes. But there's oh. an actual trend now because someone, I guess, a tree. There are people now have been falling in love with trees, so tree mentally huggers. mentally unstable. Well, that's what you say. So... This is, like, this is the new progressive frontier. This is where we are. And uh, we actually now go live to a press conference being held by a representative from the other side oh. of the spectrum uh, who disagrees with them. Their spokesperson is about to take the podium. Thank you for coming as an ambassador of the Tree 2 movement, a personal survivor of ecosexual assault, and a self professed strong fembotanist. I am appalled at the lack of compassion, self awareness, or accountability as it relates to the ongoing sexual abuses of my treeple without consent. Largely because they cannot consent. This has been an ongoing struggle, which treeple Americans sadly learned to live with, but with the recent events occurring at Kevin Spacey's nursery and the widely publicized herbicide of Harvey Weinstein's potted ficus, we can no longer stay silent. Because that plant had a name. His name was ficus. Ficus Morningwood. And he was my friend. And for fear of the ramifications to my everlasting shame, I stayed quiet. But not anymore. We will be silenced no more. The Tree 2 movement is here to be heard and here to stay. I will now open the floor for any questions you may have. Yes? Bro, is, uh, is your name really Hardwood? <laughs> I don't know what they were expecting. I don't know what Lauren was expecting. Her face did this. Something other than what she's hearing, I think. <laughs> You should have known better, Lauren. Sorry. You had a point, it's Gerald. Your fault. Flip along, brother. So the, the, I've regretted coming here since the moment I touched <laughs> yeah, you. Yeah, exactly. I apologize. So, so going back to yesterday's conversation, where exactly would the front hole be? With a tree on the on the earth. Well, explain context if, for people who don't. I know. I said going back to yesterday. They they can. Not everyone knows. Not uh, everyone has joined Mug Club because there's a the bunch of poor asses well, out there on the YouTube LGBTQ who can't afford sixty nine dollars a year, which is which is a problem. <laughs> which is definitely a problem. Stop doing the Starbucks. Okay, anyway. La Lauren, do do Gerald's job for him. What's the context of front hole? <laughs> I have to be the one to explain this. <laughs> yeah. I get to explain front hole. And what you are <laughs> privileged with the task of explaining it. Well, friends, uh, you must know by now that using the proper terms for genitals is a very offensive thing to it do is. because not everyone can have vaginas. So I thought you were going to avoid saying it. I was going to, and then I realized I couldn't. I was, my brain was going. It was like going through words, scrolling, and I'm like, nope, I nope, it. I got nothing. I really thought you were going to avoid it. Uh, yes. This was not my fault. So we covered it yesterday. They want us to call them front holes. Yes. Yeah, front holes. Uh, and you know what? We're probably not going to. In other news, <laughs> John Stewart, by the way, came to the aid of two oh. goats on the run in Brooklyn. This comes from the New York Post. The comedian turned farmer rescued the two rogue goats caught running around on the end train tracks. So uh, the two goats are actually taken to an upstate <laughs> sanctuary where they'll, this is a, a feel-good story. They're going to yeah. be taken care of, cared for, well-fed, then groomed and given a late-night talk show. Donald Trump is a piece of 
butt. Michael Cohen can suck my butt. And I hope Paul Manafort gets in by the butt. I don't even know which context <laughs> oh. those beliefs would be necessary. It also wow. almost seems like <laughs> someone writing this program uh, is horribly confused between goats and sheep. <laughs> <laughs> or that's all we had the wardrobe for. Uh, oh my Thank God. you, Lauren, for tolerating. By the way, hit the that's notification awesome. bell, join Mug Clipper, subscribe <laughs> on iTunes if you want to listen to this uh, audio on the go. You do. You, it, was a, it was a good uh, Samantha yeah. Baugh. I'm pleasantly surprised. She's going to come back to haunt me. <laughs> it will. Don't ever run for office. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, but do appear in Sharknado 5. That'll actually, that'll, that'll, that'll reverse course for it's you. the only thing that makes me feel better. <laughs> Coulter, you and I now. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I, that's significantly worse. Speaking uh, of animals, by the way, a Chinese man was fined for releasing pigeons on the highway. Uh, if you're wondering how could this go wrong, let me explain to you how. So he told police he'd been keeping 60 to 70 pigeons, but he decided to set them free. And uh, he said he chose the highway because it was a wide open space full of cars. Yeah. Who, what, <laughs> in case you didn't know how this would end. <laughs> I set them free. Oh. Not exactly. Yeah, about half of them survived. But look, look, let's not be too picky here. This does come from a country that eats dogs. So this is a step in the right direction. Yeah, Wait, do they eat dogs in China or is it just Vietnam? No, it's China. That was the whole festival was in China when we talked about it. Really? Yes, they have like an entire dog eating festival. Another reason to not like them. <laughs> and people got They inflate their currency and they eat man's they best eat the pooches. Friend. Have you ever seen us. those those posters of vegans where they're like, at which point do you side? Do you do you decide which ones are food? And they have a picture of like a cat, dog, pig, cow, da da da. And like everyone puts because vegans are trying to say like they're all beautiful animals, but everyone just no. puts the line before pig. They're like this one. <laughs> <laughs> I draw the line at tasty. Yeah. Tasty. yeah. Right. <laughs> they turn junk into bacon. They're Take amazing. Those same <laughs> vegans and show them a fetal chart and watch them explode like a fembot in Austin Powers. <laughs> um, hey, speaking of which, I don't know if you know. Do you know that? There's an all-female SWAT team what? now. What? Yeah, being deployed to protect the Indian Prime Minister. This comes from MSN.com. They're expected to play a major role in the security detail for the Prime Minister's address on Independence Day uh, <laughs> after being inducted by the Delhi police. Oh, my gosh. Um, <laughs> It just sounds funny, Delhi police. <laughs> <laughs> we are protecting all you see. Good, good for you. Uh, not idea. exactly the hope diamond, but an all-female security detail, I know might seem odd, sorry about yes. this, Lauren, but we do try to keep an open mind here. Lotto with Crowder, hands yeah. while you're in the studio, uh, if not a little bit of tokenism. So we've decided to look just at the bit. pros and cons in this week's Eye on India. So the pros and cons of an all-female SWAT team. Yeah, yeah. Um, Got to be some pros. There are definitely some pros. I know you. You thought this. Would, this is not a woman-hating club. No, no. I don't know. We We've been pretty one. welcoming. You oh, I hate Rue. If <laughs> <laughs> you hate, did you not oh, along very well? Apparently, I didn't get the memo. Oh, oops. <laughs> Just gay men. Just my only friends are gay men. Yes. Really? It's, it, it seems like you have a lot of gay male friends. Yeah. Why? They're, they're the only people that talk to me. <laughs> Talk to you. <laughs> well, we that's questionable. You. We had a <laughs> safari yesterday Whoa. with my wife. She See? likes there you. you. <laughs> Maybe in, she's a gay man. Believe, believe, <gasps> have you asked? Believe in yourself, Lauren. That's all you need. There's a little you self belief. Ask. I, I have asked in a multitude of ways. So there are some pros for an all female SWAT team in India. Uh, pro, for example, highly proficient in the art of passive aggressive dialogue. Ah, Very yeah. useful. On the, it's mental warfare. Uh, <laughs> another pro. They're 23% more cost effective. Oh, yeah, with the pay gap. Yeah, Love 23% more cost effective. <laughs> uh, another pro, this long distance swimming. Yeah. Okay. A lot of people didn't know that. You didn't know that? No, Did you know that? that? Long distance swimming. Did you know that women are better at long distance swimming? <laughs> How do you not know this? It's the one mm. physical thing you are better at than men. And you don't <laughs> it's like... the only thing? It's the only thing? As far as a sport. Yeah. They're like better. They're better than men at long distance swimming. Women are actually. I I, hmm. I, 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 I. I had no idea. Well, I didn't know. If like if I put this way, if women were better at almost all the sports than men, and then we had one thing, like we would be clinging to that. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you just have healthier egos. Um, cons, <laughs> of course, cons to an all-female SWAT team. Vulnerable when cold, and the units forget their jackets. That's yeah, one. Yeah, that's that bad. definitely mm. is. Uh, it's chilly. Next con: unit often incapable of being able to even. Mm. 
Yeah. Mm. It seems a little odd on the mil- on the battle for putting them at the front lines. Uh, another con, unit available. They're they're unavailable four to six days out of the month. That seems Ooh. obvious. We can move on. Another con, uh, pull-ups. Yeah, pull-ups is right there. And the final con is every other physical activity, unfortunately, for an all-female <laughs> SWAT team. Outside of long-distance swimming. Outside of long-distance long dis- I mean, if this swimming. is like a water attack, they're golden, right? But I going to say sharks. Sharks. you got to save the prime minister from sharks. From sharks? What is he doing golden. swimming? Okay. I don't know. Well, well, why don't Kenny not, can Indians not swim? Are you I, no, I didn't say that. Mm. You're putting words mm. in my mouth now. So let's see. We've offended the Chinese, <laughs> the Indians. We, we got time to offend everybody else. Don't worry. Pretty, but here, we, look, here, here's the thing. I say go for it. Like, if this guy gets assassinated, it's his own damn fault at this point, right? If he, yes. picks, the, if he picks an all-female crew, <laughs> go for it. Prove the model or don't. the 600-meter Olympic swim team. Yeah, exactly. How could this go this way? On well, land. He didn't have well, the why? foresight. Uh, maybe it's a trade-off. He's like, nice view. Oh, my 15% gosh. 15% more likely <laughs> to... <laughs> Die. <laughs> I'll take the coin toss. You said it. You said it. It's just Bollywood film star. Yeah, exactly. Yes, yes. That's a better state. <laughs> yes. Before he dies. Finally, oh uh, a Canadian prime minister, Justin Trudeau, is now defending his recent racist uh, attack. Yeah. That he, I guess his he called this heckler racist. Um, you know what? Let's just before let's just roll this clip right here, and I'll explain to you. That, so that's what my entire maternal uh, uh, family members sound like. I'm, uh, my whole mom's side. I met them. He's right. Yeah. Are they always sound drunk. There you go. So she's asking him about about the refugees costing hundreds of billions of dollars to the uh, taxpayer. And here you go. Here he is. He's Racism. saying this racism plays no role in Quebec. Now, do you speak? You don't speak French, do you? No. I don't. Okay. All right. So that was just as I was trying to trans. She's basically saying, "Hey, what about the cost of the asylum seekers and refugees?" And he just says, "Yeah, you're a racist." <laughs> it's it's extremely frustrating because you've also got the media and just the progressive education system supporting this and saying, "Yes, it's a racist view to ask about taxpayers' money being wasted on illegal migrants. It's a racist view." to have borders. It's a racist yeah. extremist view to want to have a nation state with an identity. That is completely false. The extremist opinion is Trudeau's opinion mm. to destroy borders, to destroy a national identity. If you don't have those things, you're not a country. So why are we pretending women like this who are asking rational questions are the extremists? It's a lot harder for Canada too because unlike the United States where we're, our identity was uh, basically a series of ideas, Canada's identity was sort of, you know, kissing the ring of the queen. It was an <laughs> actual colony. European identity. It was, very, it was a colony. That's different. Yeah. The United States identity was never racially tinged. Right. It was entirely constitutionally based. Based. People don't understand that in Canada or in places like Germany. For them, it was a people, and so it's, yeah. it's a little bit of a tougher transition. Yeah. Well, ab- absolutely. She said it right. So this woman actually said illegal immigrants in her question. He in- originally responded from the podium, immigrants. No, she, but she said, "Des, des immigrants illegal." <laughs> That's basically what it was. <laughs> That's actually what it but sounds did you see like. See what he did? He replied with immigrants. Your your hostility towards immigrants has no place here. And then later on, said the racism. Yeah, racism. He immediately changed it back to exactly. try to change the word. Again. Immigrants aren't a race. Exactly. And yeah, illegal and they're illegal and people legal that are there. Are different. Yeah. And we were talking about this yesterday. They, you said they get all kinds of benefits when they go there. They get picked up and taken like a valet service to a hotel for immediately a while. 2 years of welfare. Like they are yeah. getting more money than Canadians and Canadians are paying for this. We yeah. have Canadians that are well, struggling that are on the streets. We have hun- literally hundreds of thousands of kids in Canada that are below the poverty line, and you're bringing in tons of illegals from America. Thanks, by the way. Yeah, you're <laughs> deal welcome. with your you're own welcome. situation. Don't send them to us. Yes, I know. No, no, no. We're sending them north. <laughs> I don't know. We should just we should just send send them all to Mexico, even the ones who aren't from there. <laughs> <laughs> They'd be incredibly confused. Hey, be free margaritas, go south. Or send them all to Quebec. And like, <laughs> people don't realize, like, French sounds kind of sexy, right? But people, they think of French, like, people say, oh, I, I, I like sleeping. Moi, j'aime dormir uh, au naturel, you know? But it, yeah. that's, that's what French Canada sounds like. Like, ordering potatoes, European French would be like, uh, je veux des pommes de terre, s'il vous plaît. But in Quebec, it'd be, je veux des patates frites, s'il <laughs> That's actually what they sound like. I'm not even saying words you understand, but they, I think you hear the Are they friends. drunk at this point, or is that normal? <laughs> it's Tuesday. Uh, but here to give his... Do we have him? Here to give his side of the story, yeah. actually, is Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. Uh, Prime Minister, are you there, sir? Thanks for having me, Stephen. Now, Prime Minister, you were recently criticized uh, There's no for place some of... for racism in Canada. I-, I didn't ask my question. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, reflexes. Please continue. You were recently criticized for how you responded to a constituent during a speech. Yes, she was yelling hate speech. 
the question was when the federal government would repay Quebec for the cost that it's incurred as a result of the influx of illegal immigrants coming across the Canadian-U.S. border. That was the question that she asked. Right. Hate speech, yeah. How, how, how exactly is that hate speech? Well, I, um, I really hate it when people yell questions at me. It, it actually seems like a reasonable question, Prime Minister. Yeah. You have to see exactly what she said, actually. Uh, quarter person of color, Garrett, can you roll clip C? He doesn't get to ask uh, you that, no. Yeah, you don't get to ask him that. Any. I'm the That's Prime not. Minister. Not of this show, you're not. Uh, what about the question, though? Do you think that loose immigration laws and incentives for asylum seekers have added to your $1.4 trillion deficit? Maybe? You, you know as well as I do, Stephen, that deficits are not an indicator of long-term economic viability. But, but Prime Minister Harper ran a surplus for years. Off the backs yeah. of our First Nations people, Stephen. What, what was... What was that? I don't, two -spirited communities. I, I don't know what's I happening. I feel so ashamed when I think about how far we thought we... This seems like a constant... Um, oh. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, everybody. That's not going anywhere good. Uh, I still can't believe you got the Prime Minister on this. I know. Impressive. I know. Yeah. What did I, you give him? Like, I, how'd you get him? I also can't believe we got a raped tree. Uh, oh, yeah, that, is, know, that, that was a good get. Fail. That was a very good get, you know? <laughs> Oh, uh, I mean, I think you know that he is who he is, right? That's yeah. not offensive to you. That Justin Trudeau, oh, I've accepted it. Yes, I just, okay. I don't talk about Canada. No, you know, it's, <laughs> Canada had, had no, they have no idea how good they had it with uh, Harper. They really don't understand how well, right. he, the housing crisis was largely avoided because of his policies. And they just never appreciated him. It's yeah. much like the Northern Europeans. They get this like kind of socialism and this diversity, this beautiful utopian mindset because they have all of these other countries protecting them from third world mass immigration. We have America protecting us. We don't need an army. <laughs> we don't need to worry about the Mexican border. We have water and America. So we think, <laughs> look at our perfect country, you dummies. We don't have to do anything. Not of just that. against Im immigrants, but also uh, bombs. Well, rockets, yeah. 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 You guys would have you guys would have a snowball's chance in hell against rockets. <laughs> I don't know if you know that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> doesn't, doesn't end well for you. Wouldn't end well, you know, if, if it's a choose your own path book, it's like, oh, Canada gets screwed. Let me path B. C path A it still gets screwed. <laughs> it's amazing. We we hate America so much. When I was growing up in school, I used to just tell kids I was American just to oh see gosh. how mad they would get. Yeah, they all hate Americans. But as soon as things get rough, oh America, where'd you go? Yes, <laughs> we're exactly. gonna need you over Please here. Protect us. <laughs> yeah. I know you guys have Omaha Beach and the ones, but can we just get Juno? Juno sounds good. I you know, can just walk really onto that one, right? right? By the way, of course, Canada really helped us in World War II. I'm we not believing it. that at all. But do you, we actually used to watch footage. So I'd seen Saving Private oh, yeah. Ryan. Yeah. The film, obviously, and right, as soon as they, you know, yeah. you're like, oh my god! And then I watched actual footage in school of Juno Beach, and uh, they actually get off, they get off the, the the pontoon boats, and they run into the mist to the point where I'm like, well, they got up there, they got pretty far, they didn't even need berry pepper. No, <laughs> it, it was pretty easy for them. I mean, just to be honest. So anyway, uh, let's move on to the let's move on to the Me Too movement here. Mm -hmm. Recently, two prominent uh, sexual harassment cases, so involving women abusing men, oh, have wow. surfaced. The other way around. That yeah, can't so happen. No, I, Don't be silly. Well, yeah. it, it does happen every now and then, but usually the guy gets high fived. That's oh. the <laughs> that's the secret we yeah. don't let you in on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so first, and I want to make sure I pronounce her is Asia Argento. Asia. You know when it's spelled like. Uh, I'm gonna say Asia. Am I the yeah. only one? Well, like, that's, I think that's it's fine. Asia. Asia. Why? No. Mm. <laughs> Don't know these. I'm gonna go rape a guy. I had eccentric parents. Um, so <laughs> the, the first one, and this is why we're asking you, where you line up on sort of wh wh where the dividing line is, and it's different for everyone. You want to believe people, of course. You want to come to the aid and protect women who have been victimized. Yeah. But you also don't want to ruin people's lives. So first it was uh, Asia Argento. Uh, she was one of the original leaders of the Me Too movement. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, with her, I think she she brought forth right the, the rape accusations against Weinstein. Yeah. Yeah. She was one of the first people. So now it's been exposed that she was having sex with a minor. She knew. Uh, and uh, she, she groomed as kind of a Hollywood mom since he was, here's the thing with the story. Um, there's no easy way to, it's not like, oh, okay, well, a minor, but age of, seven years old. I think that's below everyone's cut off. A little bit. Way, yeah. Way I mean, even Muhammad would be like, geez, that's kind of harsh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I consummated when she was nine. 
<laughs> All right. Oh my gosh. You know when you offend that guy. Hold your horses. Hold your camels before I sexually accost <laughs> them, but not before seven. Uh, did I say that about Muhammad? I did. I bit. did. Send your letters. To so, him, not me. Uh, she then, by the way, issued, she, issued, she paid $380,000 in hush money to keep him quiet. Don't take my word for it. Asia Argento paid $380,000 to a young man, and he is claiming that Argento sexually assaulted him in 2013 at a California hotel. So it's official, oh. in mm. case you were wondering. For, I, I also had it wrong. Did you hear it? It's Asia. 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 Yeah. How could? How did we get it? There's. There's only three syllables, and we got them all. It's, we got three of them wrong. It's all her the, fault the and the her only parents. The thing I correct was ah. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> you know what was shocking about this? That CNN actually covered it. That's what surprised me the most. Very briefly. Very briefly, and they didn't do it the right way, but they at least had it well, on. Well, then another surprised. one that's important was uh, Habitel, I think, R Ronell, is that what is, how it's pronounced? Again, I, I, I don't know. I don't even want to try. Uh, so <laughs> an, an academic who teaches German and comparative literature at NYU. So even though, here's what's interesting about this. Do you know the story behind this person? Uh, Asia? Uh, no, we've no. We've, the next we've, we've, oh, we've uh, moved on. Okay. Uh, Havital. H Havital. <laughs> Don't worry, I was the one who bit the bullet because none of us right. knew how to pronounce these no. names. Because we, we all realize we read the news because we don't really watch or listen yeah. to it because we try to actually keep our... I try to not contaminate my mind with what Don Lemon has to say or anyone in the news, so I try to read it and that way it's kind of... But then I forget how to yeah. pronounce it. You should names. just mispronounce it and go with it. I think when you try to pronounce it correctly, well, you screwed yourself. Okay, let me clarify for you. Even though she was supposedly a lesbian... <laughs> She sexually harassed, twist, a gay male graduate <laughs> student. Is that like a double negative mentoring. making a positive? Wait, how? Yeah, well, this comes from the conservative screed, so New York Times. So Habital Ronell, then he said, she pulled him into her bed. She put my hands onto her breasts and was pressing herself, <clears throat> her buttocks onto my crotch. He Ooh. said she was kissing me, kissing my hands, kissing my torso. That evening, a similar scene played out. Again, he said, and you know that's a gay man just by his description. Right, yeah. Yeah. He made, she made me put my <laughs> hands on her breasts. That's not how it's straight man. Oh, Lord. It sounds like, sounds like a... A regular night. It sounds I mean, like a date. Actually, like that a regular sounds date. like your fantasy night. And then uh, let's she just was be honest, pressing like. herself. Hey. <laughs> uh, your Honor, may the record state that the uh, professor was twerking. Yes, <laughs> twerking. <laughs> official term. And yes, he's really gay because he didn't like it at all. No, here's here's <laughs> like any of it. Not one. <laughs> not one. Second. If you see pictures, he might not be gay. Okay. <laughs> it might just be brilliant cover at this point. <laughs> nice. No, which, were these people excoriated for it? Like everyone else in the Me Too? No. 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 Not at all. What do you think happened with them? Hmm. Hmm. I'm Could wondering. it be? Is it, you're not used to ch moving your chin beard. Yeah. You have to pretend like you have a chin beard, Lauren. Yeah. Oh, okay. Go for yeah, it. Yeah. There, you, there go. you go. Think Jafar. He's got it. Mm. Jafar. I got what it. happened? They were defended, of oh, course, oh, yeah. by the left. So, yeah. Why they, not? They even received a letter uh, defending what? her. Yeah, yeah, but both, uh. both of them actually. Si signed by a, a squad of famous academics, including. Judith Butler, you've heard us talk about her, the mother of all gender studies. What? Judith Butler, that's the one these trans Defending them? The first one to say that gender was a spectrum was Judith yeah. Butler. Even before modern gender theory, it was still kind of like with transgenders or transsexuals, there were two genders you could swap. Judith Butler was the one who said, all of them. She's the one I hate. So this is what's so infuriating about this whole Hollywood mess is now that it's like blown up with sexual assault accusations yes. against everyone, every gender, right. every group, they're suddenly saying the things that conservatives were saying years and years ago, which is assault accusations are complicated. You need to make sure yeah. you have all the facts before you persecute someone, send someone to jail or ruin their life. And it's horrible to rape someone. No conservative has ever said, great to rape someone. They've always right. thought it was bad. They've just thought, let's get the facts. Yeah. Now, suddenly, you have Rose McGowan freaking out and saying, oh, my friend's been accused. Yeah. Let's be gentle. Exactly. Yeah, let's be careful. Right. It's like, huh. Okay. No, exactly. All of a sudden, we're, we're a little hazy on the rules here. Yeah. It used yeah. to be every – they all need to be believed. Now, I don't know where we line up. Yeah, yeah, that was exactly what CNN did. Know. That's how they got it wrong. They spent right. the entire segment talking about where they got the documents from and, well, we're not really sure. and We got it from here. But they didn't speak about the, the terrible nature of what she actually did. Yeah. They spent the whole time kind of skating Working around on it. a gay guy. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> no, but I think you're – I think there's – and I think that's important to bring up. There are two kind of sides to this Me Too movement. There's exposing perverts, the Kevin Spaceys of the world, right. the Harvey Weinsteins granted. Yeah. Uh, and and holding them accountable. Absolutely. I think yeah. we should do more of that. 100%. One, little castration in there. I'm fine with it for people who've actually done it. <laughs> Just to make That's sure. That's how men yeah. feel. Men with wives mm -hmm. or mothers or daughters, we don't have a secret meeting behind your backs to be like, no. but secretly Take we like look. raping all of them. It, no. never, it never happens. Not at all. I've never once had a guy bring up rape in front of me outside of the context of a joke. Because if there's nothing else that we've learned from this show, it's that rape is 
always funny. The second side <laughs> to the Me Too movement. And demonetized. <laughs> now, quarter black, you have to show Lauren. She was laughing at that, but turning to hide herself. That's our pass. <laughs> if you're a quarter I'm hood sorry. pass, she's our uh, <sighs> nether region pass, to quote her. Yeah. Genital wow. air. I love the front, she, front hole. I front love, hole. You, I love that you cornered yourself into saying the word vagina. <laughs> yeah. There's I've never <laughs> flipped through so many word cards yeah. in my brain. And come up completely empty. <laughs> Dead gummit. There's no good word for it for women. I mean, it's like with guys, there's like Tallywhacker, Pecker, John Thomas. They're all kind of silly. But with women, they're all no. kind of sexualized. Like, there aren't a lot of silly names so, for it. Vagina is almost the most polite word. It is. It really is. It's technical. Yeah. Never exactly. found, I've gone and said it again. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I said it again. I no, no, hold on with a puff. So a, a couple. Of, <laughs> then there's the flip side, of course, which is to, we, to weaponize it, right? Yeah. A um, couple of examples here. So the case of Argento Ronell, they reveal that they, they, this crowd, like you said, they don't believe their own press. And remember, here's a clip of none other than Hillary Clinton telling you what you should do with anyone mm. who comes forward when it comes to accusations of rape. You have a right to be heard, and you have a right to be believed. I know you thought that clip might be longer. That's it. <laughs> that's oh, absolutely. That's I, all there is. Hillary Clinton. Yeah. Did yes. Stuff really? She's the one that means. She did stuff to you. Yeah. And yeah. I have a right to be believed. I, you know, it's funny. I, I would, have a right to I be would much sooner right. believe you saying it than anyone else in this room saying. <laughs> it. <laughs> that's true. Well, well, yeah. well, look with the Urban Meyer story. I mean, that's a big topic right now. I was I was really afraid for the guy because I played for him at Notre Dame. He, he was an, an unbelievable coach, but everybody immediately was saying this is the end of his career. Yeah. He's done, and he wasn't even the guy involved in the situation. Mm. Like, I understand that maybe he didn't do everything exactly right, but immediately people were like, he's done, he's out. I was so pissed off. So thank goodness it was a three-game suspension. Yeah, Sandusky kind of screwed the pooch in that one, though, so for the rest of all time. He was Boy, Meyer wasn't doing whoa, that. Whoa, whoa, okay? whoa. Sandusky whoa. was. Whoa, time out. <laughs> and Paterno we knew. in the studio. Okay, look, is not exactly the worst word we've said on air today. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> It's the worst year that know. hasn't been bleeped today. Let's put know. it that way. Okay, yeah. Um, but remember, do you remember do you remember the I regretted my date with Aziz Ansari article? Do you remember that? Did you ever read that? Yes, I feel like that was the end of the Me Too kind of cult following. And that being said, I hate him. I think he's an ass, Aziz Ansari. I do, I do not like him. He's a huge, arrogant, liberal, ungrateful, immigrant ass. But they tried to destroy his career over something with very little evidence. Yeah. And this is what, it, it's, it's, it's not about bringing perpetrators to justice. No. It's become, in large part, about demonizing men. So when the Me Too movement first broke, remember, it wasn't really about Weinstein. Immediately, they just used it as a springboard. It wasn't about blaming individuals. Yeah. They blamed what? Toxic masculinity. Oh, right? Of course. That was, yeah. I think we even have an overlay here from CNN. Yep. yep. Okay. Anyone now yelling about toxic <laughs> fake lesbianity? <laughs> but I repeat myself. You what know, happens when it's a lesbian sexual raping a gay guy? Yeah, we don't even have a file for that. I'm not sure what we do with it. Your but, guess is as good as mine. <laughs> the, the system has to change because the guy, so in, in these situations, the guy has zero recourse. Once it's out there that you sexually assaulted, assaulted somebody, even if it's not true, you can't unring the bell. Yeah. Even if these people, like, what can you do after that? Your name is ruined forever. Even if an article gets published saying you didn't do it, you're still that guy who was accused of rape or sexual I know, battery. It'll never be justice for Kevin Spacey. <laughs> you know the truth. <laughs> true. You this know is, it. This Shut is up. The thing. There's, right on a rail. Okay. <laughs> there's obviously a problem in Hollywood. Like, yeah. yes, there are these ridiculous Me Too claims, and they're just as yeah. much of a problem with the lying and everything, but sex is a powerful thing. And this is what people have, they've tried to make it seem like, oh, you can sleep with anyone, and it's no problem at all. Cosmo says it's liberal. Right. And yeah. Jordan Peterson had an interesting analysis when Me Too started. He said, this is finally going to teach our generation, like, this is something that really psychologically mm. influences people. This is something that influences yeah. society. And you need to respect it. You right. guys need to stop being so crazy and ridiculous with it. Yeah. And this is what's happened. Hollywood is in shambles because of this one thing that the liberal media tries to tell us is... Yeah so free and liberating and anyone can do it all the time. Well, I had Lisa yeah. Green on the show. I remember because a lot of people, and I, I would still would welcome her back on the show, but everyone kind of gave her, a, a, they gave her a hall pass. Yeah. And she was just saying, well, you know, in case you don't realize, women like to get laid. And I said, I'm not saying that some women don't like to get laid. What I am saying is that I believe that women, by and large, not all women, we're making a generalization, are not as sexually predatorial as men. It's like, well, disagree. <laughs> Fine. I don't need a fake <laughs> common ground with that. Right. Would, do you think women want to have sex with as many men as humanly? Because that is what all men hear. If everyone get a guy is being honest here with no moral compass, sex with as many women as you possibly could? Yeah. Everyone else? But I have a moral I mean, compass, yeah. thank God. I love my wife, though. <laughs> yes. I no, I know. I, I, know. Right. I know. I know. I'm absolutely saying. But women, are, are you hardwired that way? 
women, I even if they are tricked by media, whatever it may be, schooling to think you can do whatever you want, I think deep down they know because at the end of the day, after they've been with a guy and the guy says goodbye after Tinder, even if they both agreed to just do a Netflix and chill, they're sad. They call up their girlfriends. I've had girls call me after this and they're upset about it. And they, yeah. they're like, I don't understand why I'm upset. I don't understand yeah. why I'm attached to this guy. I only met him once. Well, how far did you go? Right. Because right. that it's literally psychologically wired in your body to make those connections. Yeah. To bond with people. It's just, mm -hmm. well, as Christians, are talk, there's kind of like a, there's yeah. a soul tie that occurs. You were, you're about to say something there, quarter black. Yeah. Uh, I, I had a friend that did the same thing that he went on a Tinder date and, you know, things happen and he felt bad after it. I mean, just, just like that. Yeah, it happens yeah. for men too. Happens Pretty forever. rare for a guy. This wasn't a <laughs> gay guy with a no, lesbian it wasn't. professor. It wasn't. No, I do. Yeah, I, I, I do. Listen, and that being said, I guess because of the moral compass component. But yeah. that being said, guys are hardwired to spread their seed. It's a goalpost moving power grab from the progressive left. That's the yeah. point. And by the way, it's one that ultimately hurts both sexes. Certainly women. Take Henry Cavill, for example. He said he was afraid to date in the Me Too era, <laughs> right? And then feminists jumped on him and said, feminists and Bernie Sanders, mm -hmm. you have nothing to fear if you're not a rapist. <laughs> You Krypton son of a bitch! <laughs> um, Superman just doesn't want to be the next subject of a Rolling Stone article. Yeah. That's it. I feel my powers weakening. Is it kryptonite? No, it's Mattress Girl! <laughs> <laughs> You have nothing to fear if you're not a rapist. You have everything to fear if you have a penis. That's know, the truth it, right it, now. Dating was hard enough when you didn't have to have written consent before you yes. kissed someone, right? Well, that's what they've it's been doing for fraternities, too. South Park went fun. Yeah. By the way, progressives have admitted that the Me Too movement is less about truth than it is about causing what they quote, a, sh a shift in power imbalances. Yeah. That's from the conversation right there. A shift in power imbalances. And that's everything. That's yeah. black. That'll be the closing uh, closing segment. I want to talk about that a little bit more because shifting power imbalances just for the sake of it, you have to figure out who's at the other end of that seesaw when you shift it. That's really yeah. important to know. And this is foundational for the modern progressive left. Like we've talked about, it's the underdog automatically has the moral high ground. Um, and unlike here, we have to get going. We have to get going to a Stephen Molyneux here in a second. Unlike John Oliver, Samantha B, or Samantha Butt, or Trevor Noah, who just bitch, I do want to be solution oriented. And you touched on this, and I think you're right. The problem we're told is we have a culture of rape. Okay, let's go along with that premise. What's the fix? The solution is the exact same kind of crap that you've been mocking for decades. Like my pen, Mike Pence not going out to, to dinner alone with a woman who's not his wife. Like not allowing your teenage daughter or son to go upstairs with the door closed and a box of Trojans. How about mm. that? Maybe teaching young people that abstinence, if not until marriage, which I still advocate. That's just a personal decision. It's just me. But at least until you're old enough and in a permanent relationship or a long-term relationship, maybe that could be beneficial. Like maybe teaching young men to serve and protect young women by holding doors for them, by not allowing them into dangerous situations. And yes, that includes the front lines of war. Why? Because pull-ups, like teaching women that motherhood is more important than your business success. Why? So they can raise successful, morally upright young men and women of their own. Maybe like teaching men, yeah, men, you don't get off the hook, about real masculinity. Let's throw away the terms toxic masculinity. How about just real masculinity, like being a leader, a good husband, a faithful husband, and a father who stays with mommy and works through the marital problems, even though his feelings might be hurt. How about that? What you call toxic masculinity, I call necessary for the survival of the human species. And you know what's not? You know what's not necessary for the survival of the human species? Identity politics, toxic lesbianism, lesbianism, I don't even remember what it was. I don't even know what you call <laughs> toxic lesbian raping gay studentism and man shaming. That's not necessary for the preservation of the human species, dummies. We'll have Stefan Molyneux after this, and then Lauren is going to interview Karen. That'll be, that'll be fun. Get you ladies. And now for Hopper Proverbs, sponsored exclusively by Mug Club. It is said that if you give a dog some cheeses, you feed him for a day. But if you give a dog a cow, I don't, well, I don't know how to make cheeses, but uh, if I had a recipe and uh, some thumbs, I probably could figure it out. Just join Mug Club so Stephen can give Hopper more cheeses, because uh, he has thumbs. <laughs> Stay tuned for more Hopper Proverbs, sponsored by Mug Club. Uh, 
All right. Very glad to have our next guest. Actually, L Lauren is not here right now. Nope. She had to use the restroom, not. which actually ties in perfectly. We're going to lead this conversation off with restroom talk. You know him, of course, YouTube.com slash Free Domain Radio, as long as they allow him. And I want to get this plug right. He's speaking at Phyllis Schlafly's Gateway Eagle Council, St. Louis, Missouri, September 13th through 16th. Of course, you see his Twitter there, Stefan Molyneux. Stefan Molyneux, did I get that right? Uh, that's that's great. I'm actually looking forward to the Eagle Forum. Uh, I pretty much assume that they're going to release a rabbit on the stage and I'm going to drop to it on the rafters. That's yeah. the whole approach. My speech is basically going to be, ah, ah. Yeah. <laughs> that's generally the plan. So, uh, you know, you have to be there or you'll miss the whole experience. Is that an honor of Phyllis Schlafly? No, just the name Eagle. Uh, no, uh, I, I like Phyllis. She, I had her on the show a couple of times. Uh, she died, of course, quite recently uh, at the ripe old age of 90-something. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, very powerful, great woman. She did a lot of great stuff pol uh, politically. She was uh, a mother of the year for her entire state. She raised six kids. Uh, yeah, quite a powerful force of nature, that woman. A lot to admire. She had actually a good sense of humor. I had to introduce her at uh, CPAC one year. So there were about four years in a row where I was this MC at, at CPAC, and then I ended up just hating my life. So uh, I stopped. But um, I, I introduced Sarah Palin and I mentioned, you know, okay, former governor of Alaska. And I said, and she's fine. And people kind of laughed. And then I brought up Phyllis Schlafly. And the very last thing I said about her was, and, uh, and I should also mention that she's fine. And she came out, she was like, oh, funny young gentleman. Um, I don't think she realized the sexual connotations there. You were saying before on air that you really enjoy speaking. Daddy-like were your words. Uh, yeah. Well, so, I mean, for a variety of reasons, reasons, not least of which being a stay-at-home dad to a toddler, but I didn't do much on the road for like half a decade. And going back out with Lauren to Australia and, uh, well, almost New Zealand was fantastic. I really remember just how much fun it is to play with an audience. Uh, and, and of course, the audience is in Australia quite interactive. Uh, and, and that was a lot of fun. The Q&A is there, a great there are fun. There a lot of the black people in Australia? I'm sorry? I said, you mean there are a lot of black people in Australia? Like, no, yeah, just a preach! Lot of people who <laughs> See, I invite them to be part of the show because you got to give them something they're not going to get by just clicking on a YouTube. So I want that interactivity and I want to play back and forth. So oh. remembering how much I like it, I'm... Uh, I'm available for uh, children's parties, bar mitzvahs, the usual. And, uh, you know, if people want me to come and speak, oh, oh I'll do it. Yeah. I'll do it. So, yeah, that's why I'm doing the Eagle Forum and got some other stuff lined up as well. Because, man, is it ever fun being out in front of an audience again. I am the exact. I hate it. I despise it. I've, we were talking about I've never liked it. Um, I've, I feel very I feel like I have to do it because people want to want to come out and see us live. And I'm very appreciative of the fans. But I was a kid who before an oral. It would feel like uh, I, I would get the same kind of bandy, bandy leggedness like Bambi's mom before uh, I would go out to jiu-jitsu matches or any kind of a sporting event. I would get so nervous, and I remember feeling like I was going to throw up, but I don't throw up. I almost never throw up. So I would just get uh, explosive uh, excrement uh, before every oral when I was a kid. I don't know why I started doing stand-up comedy. I always get nervous before audiences. I, I envy people like you who don't get the nerves. No, no, no. See, it's not that I don't get the nerves. I do, but it's more excitement. But my big fear, well, there's two big fears when it comes to public speaking, especially when you're doing like some big, huge area with a very ill-defined stage edge. Like you don't want to do a full, you know, Steve Tyler and plunge right off the stage and, and hope that someone catches you. So I actually like getting there earlier, making friends with the space and making sure I know where the edge is because they yeah. never tape it. And it's just like, good luck. Hope I don't plunge somewhere. <laughs> and the other is I have this nightmare that halfway through a speech, because I do like an hour usually or more, halfway through a speech, I'm just going to have to pee. Yeah. And it's going to come on like a tsunami, you know, and then all I'm going to see is people drinking water and all that kind of stuff. It's like when I went to go and see the movie Titanic and I had one of these giant float drinks and the entire last half of the movie is people sloshing around in water. Yeah. And I didn't want to miss anything because <laughs> I thought, well, it's got to be over soon. No, it doesn't because it's the movie Titanic. It takes actually less time for the ship to sink than for the movie to end. But uh, yeah, those are my only two big fears. And you can deal with one by making friends with the space and you can deal with the other by having four checks before you go out to speak. So after hearing that anecdote, uh, what I uh, what I glean from it is Stefan Molyneux's gay. Yeah, he went to Titanic and was actually afraid to miss uh, a portion of the Titanic. I was looking for a reason for a bathroom break. Like, I can't miss Jack, not for one moment. You can't take his eyes off him, can you? Um, no, I, I, I do. No, I, this is back when the no, this is back when you would roll the dice and you've got at least a 75-25 split on seeing uh, Kate's uh, boobs 
uh, in a movie, right? Because yeah. she was just like, this was her audition, was just like flashing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. Yeah. Every and other so, one. You know, this is back in the day when the internet was still pretty primitive and it was worth paying 12 bucks to go see some boobs. As and opposed so, to uh, Heather Graham, it was in her contract for every single film. It wasn't a 70 30 <laughs> split. It was just, a, it was a, there was no rolling of the dice. It was really just, you were just like throwing a ball. <laughs> I was just throwing yeah, a Super I Bowl. Need, I need some pants that are basically made from a headband and roller skates won't hurt, but that's basically how it rolls. That's pretty much how it goes. So, uh, but I, I know we were just talking about Lauren and how you've been touring and you have more speaking engagements coming up. I highly recommend people go go check it out. But let's talk about this. Also, you're you're you're, you're almost gone from YouTube. I mean, I say that you pro you won't be, and we'll obviously be here to hopefully uh, help you in whatever capacity we can. And people can find out where to support you. I'm sure you can tell them. But how how many hard strikes did you get immediately after Jones uh, Alex Jones? Was it two right in a row? Well, it was actually immediately after. Uh, coming back from Australia. You know, we're still trying to tunnel through that golem like jet lag that happens. And uh, basically, yeah, I mean, it was a real drive by. You know, it's like that uh, uh, Samuel L. Jackson character in Pulp Fiction, you know, bang, bang, bang. And it's just these outlines on the wall behind you because we got two community guideline strikes for, like, I don't know offensively inappropriate content or however they exactly phrase it. And yeah, it was pretty rough. And uh, one of them was on an interview I did with Katie Hopkins, noted British journalist. And the other was uh, me talking about how white males were dying in the opioid crisis in particular. So apparently all that's hateful. But, you know, kudos to YouTube, kudos to the community who uh, fired off thousands of lovely, delightful, positive and warm messages saying, hey, dudes, not fair. Back the hell off. This is an injustice. And they were taken off the account. And uh, of course, no, there's never any communication. You got to read the tea leaves. You got to, you know, just right. guess yeah. what's going on. But uh, yeah, there was a uh, chicken bones uh, in the toilet. Yeah. 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 It really, it yeah, really somebody, is. Somebody did the old mass flag. And I guess somebody in YouTube uh, thought it was bad. And I guess it went to a higher level of review. And, you know, I mean, I've never had any problems, you know, 12 years been on YouTube. I was like, I was like user number four <laughs> right. on YouTube and uh, 12 years, no problems. You go on a tour, you ruffle some feathers and boom, boom, boom. Yeah. Uh, you get all of this stuff. But, you know, this is the kind of blowback you naturally get when you're over the target. They, they, right? were, they were about to give you your walking papers like Jack Lemon and Glengarry Glenn Ross sending you out into the rain. It was real. I mean, I was I was when I heard about it at first, I was really worried and sad, but I thought this will probably be rectified. But I do appreciate YouTube is for closers. YouTube is for closers only <laughs> put that video down. I do think uh uh, and something I admire about you and something that we try to draw attention to, listen, we have we have the ability to reach the highest legal counsel at, at, at uh, YouTube-ish. They don't always respond because of my half-Asian lawyer, Bill Richman, on, on retainer and because of the fact that we found them and we made contact with them. So then it's even more damning if they don't respond. But what worries me is not what they're doing to you or to myself, because we know there's enough blowback where we can hold them somewhat accountable. But the next guys coming up uh, behind us, the people with the smaller channels, there are so many stories that we may never even know about, including you and myself, because our inboxes get flooded and we don't have the time to check all of them every day. That's the kind of thing that keeps me up at night. Well, you're absolutely right. I mean, there are the people who are the up and comers and I get messages just like you of people saying, well, you know, I did, I had a channel, I was doing it for six months, it was growing and then boom, 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 it got vanished. And this happens to Facebook pages, this happens uh, uh, on YouTube and other places. And, you know, much though I'd love to help everyone, you know, we've, we've got lives and, and audiences to please and all that. So yeah, there's a lot of people out there who are not uh, with the kind of size and reach and clout that we have, and they're getting disappeared and don't have the, si like the same kind of recourse. And that is a real shame because I want the new talent to emerge. I strongly encourage people yeah. to to take the swing at uh, trying to affect people positively in the culture wars. Uh, I try and encourage young talent as much. The, the, more, the more competition, the better. I don't know why CNN wants to wipe out competition. You know, that's a great challenge to get better. You know, why do you want to wipe out competition? They polish you to a shine. Yeah, well, I don't think you can polish down lemon to a shine. It's always a matte finish at this point. It's just like the matte finish of near death that is always <laughs> upon. There's, there's a lemon pledge joke in there somewhere, but I can't quite connect to that. He does. I just he, wanted to point that out. He looks like dead Johnny Mathis. If Johnny Mathis returned from the grave, it would look like Don Lemon. You could you could use him as a stand-in. Um, and I do hope, listen, people out there, uh, obviously reach as many of the big YouTubers as you can if your channel is removed. And we always tell people, obviously, Stefan, you know this, because sometimes we'll get messages like, hey, I just ran an entire, like we're talking about, I just uploaded 
Glenn Glary, Glenn Ross to my entire YouTube channel and took it down. It's like, hold on a second. Most of the time, you usually are violating copyright. But if you're in the right, you know that you're not, you know you're doing the right things. Yeah, do reach out to as many people as possible. Sometimes they don't get through, but we do want to help you guys. Really quick, we don't have a ton of time. We have Karen Strawn coming up. I think actually Lauren is going to fill in host for me. We'll see how that goes. Um, your recent video was titled uh, The End of South Africa, I believe. And I know you just toured with Lauren Southern, who did Farmlands, and uh, we were talking about that documentary. Um, wh what do you think happens there? Obviously, the title is provocative. People can go watch it. But how do you think this all comes down in, in South Africa? How do you think it ends? Well, I mean, I, I hate to think that it's inevitable, and the title is provocative because I don't want it to be the end of South Africa. Right. I want people to have enough food. I want them to have political freedom. So I don't want the government bungeeing in with guns to strip land from people who've been farming it for generations, right? So as you know, they changed the constitution recently to allow for the communist takeover of arms. And it's like, how many times do we have to see this damn story play out in human history? Of the last 150 years, it's like, oh, these people are doing really, really well. That's injustice, that's bigotry, that's racism. We're gonna redistribute all of their stuff and then everybody gets to starve to death. And fewer than 1% of South Africans of any race care about this land issue. It's just something that's held up to excuse bad behavior and corruption in government. It's, it's the equivalent of the Russia collusion story to explain why Hillary lost the election. It's like, well, the reason that the economy is doing so badly, the reason that, that South Africa is no longer a net food exporter, but a net food importer, the reason why the rand is crashing against the dollar, it's because there are too many white farmers. It's like, no, it's not because of that. It's because the government is horribly corrupt and inefficient, and they have really racist laws that are there to promote a lot of blacks getting into jobs, to keep whites out of jobs. It's because they have these massive uh, uh, squatter camps full of whites who are not allowed to work. It's a really horrible system they need to fix the system, but they've had the rot of communism in there for decades, starting before even the ANC and Mandela got into power. And if we can find a way to push back against this communist takeover, fantastic. If we can't, well, they're going the way of uh, the, the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia. They're going the way of the communists uh, takeover in, in Mao's China and in the Holodomor in Ukraine. Everyone's going to starve. And then everyone's going to be sitting there saying, wow, we got to help all these people. And it's like, I got to tell you, from what I'm seeing, man, there's a lot of compassion fatigue about this. Because, yeah. you know, if it's a drought, that's one thing. But if you're starving because you nationalized the farms and stole from everyone, sympathy, not massively high. And that's going to be horrible to see. It's hard to get the gap to do a campaign for that. I thought tourism had just died out there because of Leonardo DiCaprio's horrible accent and blood diamond. I mean, that'll <laughs> do damage to a country's reputation. Uh, we do have to get going. I do encourage people to go watch it. It's, uh, let me make sure. Phyllis Schlafly's Gateway Eagle Council in St. Louis, September 13th through 16th, of course, youtube.com slash freedomainradio. Stefan, thank you for being here, sir. We have to go see Karen Strawn. <laughs>All right, there, library time. First live read of the week and the last live read. We only do one live read a week. Ladderwithcutter.com slash mug club. That's what keeps this show going. Lauren has been here actually a few days this week. Uh, for those who don't see the daily show, it's, it's 45 minutes yeah. every single day. And you get the clips on YouTube, $69 annually for students, veteran, or active military. And it's what allows us to do uh, not only the show, but go on location, do the hidden camera work, do the investigative uh, work. And we appreciate so much the people who've joined up, especially with YouTube right now uh, and the instability. Uh, we really are doing a lot better because so many fans have joined up and supported and we're growing and we're moving into a new place and we're going to be confronting more people, more Change My Minds. Next week is Razor Fist, bringing in, supporting the people who stuck their neck outs for us. So we appreciate any support. You don't have to. You can watch the free stuff, but it might go away if not enough of you do join up. Lottoscredit.com slash mug club. Hey, be strong congressman. How's your vet feel today? A little tight, actually. Oh, no, that's bummer. That's bummer. I hope no one sneak into your place at night and change your... Street number, you have a set to 10, I think, right? Someone change it, baby, for like a 9.5. How did you know that, man? Western mother. Slightly inconvenient, no one knows why. Passive aggressive Chinese spy. That's me. So good at dancing. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Louder with Lauren. And today we are with the wonderful, beautiful Karen Strawn uh, from Girl Writes What and Honey Badger Radio on YouTube. Karen and I actually haven't seen each other since we went to a slut walk together in Alberta, I think, was it? Yeah, it was in Edmonton here. 
Good you, times. you got to sleep on my couch, which probably wasn't fun. <laughs> no, it was a very, very cozy couch. Now, I understand that you wanted to talk about the Asia, Asia, can't pronounce her name, Argento situation. Uh, one of the first accusers of Harvey Weinstein and one of the founders of the Me Too movement. And you want to talk about the fact that she has just been accused herself of statutory rape with one of her co-stars, actually a younger male. It's it's a little bit of a weird story. Like I think the uh, the statutory rape thing kind of muddies the waters because I mean everybody knows that there are 17 year olds out there who are capable of con consenting to sex, right? Mm -hmm. In Canada, our age of consent is, is 16. But um, what really struck me about this particular case is, is that they met on set when he was seven years old or something like that. Ooh. And they have really? had this, uh, they formed a bond that they both described kind of like a mother-son bond. And she's still calling him her son and, you know, like her sonny boy and all this. I don't think that's it's how it works. It's like a Macron uh, situation. You know, the French president with his, his much older wife that used to be his teacher. And they've got this weird, like, mommy-son creepy role play thing going on. Yeah, well, and, and he describes the situation as something that re actually really messed him up. Hmm. So essentially, and she was 37 and he was 17. So that's like a significant age difference there. Then you factor in the relationship between them. That that might mess somebody up. Yeah. And uh, as the responsible adult in the room, she probably should have, you know, even if he was interested she should have said no no this is not okay but um TMZ so i think has... the age itself being under the age of consent just confuses the real weirdness of this situation right right and and tmz has come out with the photos of them now in bed together so there were some doubts now people are a little more kind of sure that this did happen. What do you make of Rose McGowan's comment? So she came out and said, everyone needs to hold their judgment and be gentle towards Asia Argento. After well, I think that people should withhold their judgment for sure until evidence but comes out But that's not how McGowan any was allegation. treating anyone else in Hollywood, was it? Or that's anyone right. in general. <laughs> McGowan was saying, that's right. believe all victims, believe all victims, unless they're men. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's absolutely the the problem. Or unless who they're accusing is a woman, um, that that's the issue that I have. Is like I would argue in favor of Rose McGowan's approach to this case that that should be the approach to every case. Um, but that's not what the Me Too movement is arguing. You know, I believe survivors. I believe victims. Every acquittal is is a miscarriage of justice, right? Um, every man who comes out with evidence, uh, you know, or every time something like the University of Virginia, um, you know, Rolling Stone false accusation comes out as false and is discredited, that that's actually um, proof of somebody getting away with it somewhere. So the whole thing is just annoying and and it's frustrating and it's hypocritical yeah hollywood is a mess i can't even look at it anymore it upsets me no. their lives are all just they need to sort that out now something else that is a mess and you talk about it a lot on honey badger radio free speech situation a uh, famed internet provocateur count dankula who taught his pug dog how to do the nazi salute and was brought up on hate speech charges in the uk has now lost his case and subsequent appeal and he is trying to take the case to the uk supreme court for a final appeal to see if he has the right to make a joke without being prosecuted essentially your thoughts my thoughts you know like when you when you watch the video and i did watch the video and i found it hilarious and played it for my kids and they found it hilarious is your dog um, also a fascist what... <laughs> sorry is your dog also a fascist my dog is i would say she's borderline personality right. And it's called disorder, but she's she's not high, she's not extremely political. <laughs> okay, um, but uh, essentially, he said he prefaced the joke with, 
to play a prank on my girlfriend, I'm going to turn her cute wee dog into the least cute thing I can think of, which is, of course, a Nazi. Mm-hmm. Right? So I, thinking of the worst possible thing I could turn this dog into, which would indicate that he doesn't like Nazis. The guy actually also, this is something that the mainstream media never mentions, he has a giant tattoo on his chest of a hammer and a sickle. That's something the media conveniently forgets when they discuss this case. (laughs) I don't think that he's, uh, I think his political views have changed since he got that permanent badge, you know, um, but at the same time, he's definitely not far right, um, he, he's not he's not a fascist he's not yeah not anything but like that but certainly people in this day and age who just appreciate comedy humor uh, free speech discussing different ideas they're forced and they're pushed to being in this bizarre sphere amalgamation of men's rights activists anti sjw's conservatives libertarians classical liberals everyone who's been just forced to support each other's free speech together and in some cases support the far left's free speech as well despite the fact that they want to take all of ours away Now, one more thing here I wanted to ask you about. There's this March for Men that is taking place in Australia, and it has you all up in arms. Can you tell me a little bit about that? I I don't know much. Um, It's being organized by a woman named Sydney Watson, who has a YouTube channel. Oh, yes, I've heard of her. Yeah, she's not um, super, super popular. Like, she's not in the millions of subscribers or anything, but but she's, she's got a good head on her shoulders. She's conservative. She... She's quite similar to you and her views. Um, and she, like, recently there was a young woman killed, Eurydice Dixon, who was uh, raped and murdered while walking home from work at night. And ever since then, it's just been this constant barrage in the media and in politics, in parliament, of uh, calling all men to task over the behavior of those few men who do things like that and painting all of masculinity as responsible for this and then essentially saying, well, women shouldn't have to learn how to protect themselves. Uh, Men need to stop raping and killing us, right? As if all men do this. And uh, so she kind of got sick of it. So she decided she was going to have a march for men. And of course, all of the rhetoric now is about how she's alt right, she's uh, she's a fascist, she's a misogynist, she's this march for men, full stop, mar- full stop march for men, is racist, right? Um, because I guess because white men are included in that category, and anything that includes white men is racist, right? So, and and I'm just watching this go down. And she just seems like that one of the most solid people. She's, she gave a solid pitch. She essentially said women and men should not be at each other's throats. We are stuck with each other. We need to learn how to love one another, work together, cooperate, have each other's backs. This is not a march to slam women. This is not a march that's political in any way. Everybody is welcome, men, women of all political stripes, um, just to support men, just to show that men matter. It's crazy. I was at uh, a feminist march in the UK and before I got kicked out, and they started screaming at my cameraman because they said, no men on the march, no men on the march. So not only was it a march only for women, no one had a problem with that, of course, they wouldn't even let men march with them and screamed and attacked men who came near the march to try and support it or to film it. So the radio silence on that. And yet this poor girl who's organizing a men's march, absolutely being Oh, yeah. And, and on top of that, there's a counter-protest planned um, between essentially Australia's Antifa and uh, some other feminist groups, the National Union of Students, um, Women's uh, Caucus or something like that. What are that. they protesting against? I, like, 
men have issues too. They have high suicide rates, like massive. They're, they're more likely to be killed on, on the job. Look at, I saw it, it was almost parody, like I'm sure you saw it too, in the UN mm -hmm. women's page on Facebook. They posted something where it was like, 17% of journalists killed are women. This is a disaster. Yeah. We have to face this problem and address it. And everyone's kind of sitting there like, wait, doesn't that mean the other yeah. 80 some odd percent are men? <laughs> Which makes well, yeah, them we majority. gotta get those numbers up. <laughs> we, we, gotta, we, gotta, we gotta get more female journalists killed to make things equal, right? I mean, I've seen similar things like that, uh, you know, globally, 60 million children of elementary school age are out of school. Half of them are girls. Well, no, duh. <laughs> you know, um, yeah. but we're supposed to care more because girls are affected and and people do yeah. care more. Yeah, yeah. It's it's yeah. sad. It's sad. But thank goodness we have people like you sticking up for men's rights, even though it's tough and you get all the slander. But it's good to have you. When I was young and I started going to the slut walks uh, before I got into this crazy world, you had my back. And now you have Sydney's back. And thank you so much for that, Karen. Uh, but we got to right, move no. on to the next segment. So I'll see you guys later. All right. Thank you. When the dance I feel drowsy. I did not sleep well last night. Oh no! How come? It's weird, because I always take Tylenol PM and it works like a dream. You know, I accidentally put your normal Tylenol in your PM Tylenol bottle. I'm so sorry. Oh, I switched them by mistake. Oh no, you'll probably be slightly less productive in the morning, all because of sorry old Ming. I'm sorry. Why would you do that, Ming? I don't know, shitty old Ming. I'm sorry. Stupid, indulgent, western son of a- Slightly inconvenient, no one knows why. Passive, aggressive, Chinese spy. That's me! Blake Lively. Oh if you ever saw The Shallows, this was every single shot of her swimming was this. <laughs> and in real life, if she did this with her mouth, she'd lose all her air and the great white would eat her. Yeah. Also, by the way, she doesn't have better vision underwater than a great white shark. Mm. Little known fact. Know hey, uh, everyone, get, get, show them you love them. Uh, Quarter Black Garrett. What's, your, what's the Twitter? Is it QTR? QTR? It was too long. Black Garrett. Yeah, they wouldn't let me. They're Doing a hell of a job there with the TriCaster. Learning this Thank new you, you stuff, know. we appreciate it. it. used to be Key Grip Garrett was always a little bit of a thorn in my side because he was a smart ass. You know, he smoked too much. He I mean, kicked, you know, that, I, kicked that mostly. I did. I did. And, uh, of course, Lauren Southern, thank you so much. And uh, Stefan Molyneux, Karen Strawn, thank you. We yeah. really appreciate it. Next week, we are going to have Razor Fist. Actually, Razor Fist was going to be here this week. Yes, he was. And uh, I hope I'm not li his, his dad was sick. He had to take care of him. Really looking forward to Razor Fist. And we, I know we also have Matt Eisman, who's going to be in third chair. Owen Benjamin, again, of course. Hodge Twins, Boss Rutten. We might even have Brian, Sh World's Strongest Man. I don't even know how we'll yeah. fit him in the studio. I'm so excited. I don't know how he's going to get through the door. I have no idea. We might have to have him with, with Too Cute Maddie, our... our uh, our female editor, the only female editor we've ever had. Uh, very proud of that. Uh, <laughs> get awkward in the, in the, in the offices. It, it does know. get awkward in the office sometimes. So sorry, Madison or Mom, if he's dressing me up. But uh, there won't be a show Monday because we are going to be working on possibly the biggest change my mind Ooh. we've ever done. We have some hidden camera stuff. To give you an example, the team that puts this together, that Crowder Confronts that you saw this week, that was months of following this person. <laughs> we have videos that are months in the making, and then sometimes we work on them for months and nothing happens. So that's what I'm talking about, the, the new era of the super videos here, because there are enough people at uh, uh, loudoscreator.com slash club who've joined up, and if you continue Thank to you. join up, we can do that. But it's not like Jimmy Kimmel where I can send out Guillermo. I am Guillermo. I am the Larry Budnam. I have to go out, and actually we might need to find someone who can do some prosthetics for disguises. So a lot oh, I'm of working changes. On that. Uh, so what was it, MonsterCon, Monster Pop? Uh, Monster Palooza. Monster Palooza. Yeah, I'm gonna be out there looking. That sounds really sad. 
What if you just took me to Monster Palooza, but I wore a Comic Con costume, like an Optimus Prime? That'd be awkward. Would they be really mad? <laughs> I don't know. I, I think I, it's a video. I'm looking. I, I bet there's going to be a lot of them there. I think we need to do that. Something that would be completely out of place, but would still seem nerdy, but they would be elitist in their nerddom. Um, so this is what I want to talk with you about. Uh, Today, you know, a lot of times people are looking for something. I'm a 31-year-old 30, guy who gives a crap what I have to say as far as life advice, but it matters to some of you. So this is something that actually uh, was on my heart this week because I was watching my favorite movie ever. So all this Me Too, the Black Lives Matter, the democratic socialism, it all spawns from the same evil. It, it all comes from this idea of shifting the balance of power simply for the sake of shifting the balance of power. It's the foundational philosophy of the left. We all know it. We've talked about it. The sort of underdog theory. It's known by another word. Envy. So one of my favorite films is, is The Edge. Uh, is, have you seen... No? I have not. Oh. I have not. I want to, though. I watched the trailer. Silence. You keep talking about Silence. it. Silence. I want to watch it. It is. As a matter of fact, you know, let me say, it, the reason why is because it is my favorite film. It is, it is not maybe. It is my favorite film, period. I'll say that. People give me crap about that all the time. But go go and watch the film. Comment here. Let me know what you think. Whenever I talk with someone about this film, I'm like, oh, that's your favorite. Shouldn't it be Godfather? Shouldn't it be? Well, I think Chinatown was a better film, by the way. Uh, who cares about the Quaaludes and the 14-year-old? It was a good film. But The Edge is my favorite film. Everyone comes back and says... Yeah, it was pretty good. No one comes back and says, no, nah, I thought it sucked. So this is one of those ideas where you're conditioned to not like films. I get it. There are a couple, couple of lines in the film that might be cheesy. There are a couple of green screen sequences that maybe don't hold up today. Um, but I think it's at least the most underrated film of the last quarter century. And I just found out that the, the writer, David Mamet, is going to be on the show, the same writer of Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, who he oh. wrote The Edge, The Untouchables. Uh, is it oh, I don't know. He, he wrote a he, most prolific stage writer of our generation. He's written a lot of great films. He's going to be on the show. I cannot tell you how excited I am. He actually uh, came out of the closet as a conservative with an article titled, I believe it was, I don't have it in front of me, Why I'm No Longer a Brain Dead Liberal. New York Times, I believe, is where he wrote it. That's funny. I could be wrong. Someone like, it was New York Magazine. But I, I don't know exactly where it was, so someone can maybe let me know. I don't have a source for this. I didn't prep for this. But... It's like I just was, my mouth was getting dry, so I had to drink, and that's awkward for people who are listening on audio. By the way, subscribe on iTunes uh, if you aren't for when you're on the road. Um, he, here's the thing. He wrote The Edge long before the article where he came out as a conservative. And this is a big reason I love the film. There are tons of reasons to love the film, especially when you rewatch it. It's one of those, it's like a video game where you backtrack and there are Easter eggs. Nearly every single shot, almost every line of dialogue means something. But something that is singularly unique about this film, The Billionaire played by Anthony Hopkins. The character's name is Charles Morse. Kind of a spoiler alert here. Three, two, good. The billionaire is actually the good guy. And this relates back to the point I'll be making. In the realm of cinema where the wealthy person is nearly always the big evil oil baron or the corrupt Wall Street banker, here's this film where Charles Morse, the billionaire, surrounded by artists, photographers, and, and even minorities, by the way, one of whom just gets the crap of him mauled out of a bear, way worse than the Revenant scene, hey. Uh, the standout man of character, the true blue character, is the old white guy. Patriarchy personified. Charles Moore throughout the film, he not only improves people's lives, but he saves them. And the point is that sometimes shifting the balance of power merely for the sake of it doesn't take into account who's going to get the power once the shift is completed. Sure, some of the worst people throughout history were powerful. So were all of the best. And if we try to strip power from people simply because we perceive them to hold it, as we're talking about now in this, these articles, you see them with, with Me Too, that's the end game with democratic socialism. So if, if we want to strip power just, just because people have it, that's the, that's the reason, well, who's going to maintain the balance of power afterward? Hillary Clinton? The Me Too charlatans? The LGBTQ AAIP movement? Feminists? Well, just because they aren't Charles Morse? Something else on the edge that... that, that uh, really stands out to me, is everyone in the film wants something from this billionaire. At every turn, he doesn't know who to trust. He doesn't know their motives. It's incredibly isolating. I really highly recommend this film. And there are a lot of undertones here that I could get into. Hopefully, I will with David Mamet when he's on the show. But it's really easy to vilify people of power or perceived wealth. And you know why it's easy? Because it's a lot harder to look ourselves in the mirror for the selfish pieces of garbage that we all are when we want something from those people. Well, I don't know. It could be cheaper deodorant while we all vilify Walmart. It could be cheaper gas while we vilify oil companies. Or safer streets while we vilify cops. You know, I, I've known a few wealthy people in my life. I've been fortunate enough to know a few wealthy people. Uh, no, I am, not, I am not amongst them. 
But I've seen it happy with them. Happy. I've seen it happen with them. Uh, people like, um, I don't want to, you know, okay, Mark, Carrie, Kevin, uh, all people I've seen with folks tugging at their sleeve, demanding something of them. And you know what happens when these people don't get what they want? Who's a dick? Rich jerk. And that's how the shift of power just for the sake of it begins. It sprouts from the seed of selfishness. I know people say, oh, where are you going with this? Because all of us do this. The difference is it's a foundational principle of the teaching of the modern left. To use an example, Kevin, this is a real person, uh, an incredibly wealthy, I'd, I'd like to, I feel fortunate to say friend of mine. I'm always uncomfortable asking him for anything, even though he's offered a lot. You know this guy. Um, to give you an idea, okay, let me, let me give you some examples here. I'm, try, I'm trying to make sure they don't reveal identity, but I, I don't really think they care. Let me, let me give you two examples. There are two videos completed here at Louder with Crowder. This team never would have been able to do if not for this man, Kevin, lending us his personal plane. I know it sounds like people, oh, white, white people problems. Listen, yeah, the guy has a plane. Good for him. But you know why he lent it to us? Just to be a blessing. To, just to be a blessing, not, not only to us, but to you, the fans. One of them was a Crowder conference. One of them was the whole GAF conference and why, because we, we, there was no way to get out there commercially. And there were, there were over 800 fans in that, in that uh, not mess, a ballroom. I wouldn't have been able to see. He knew that we needed to get six crew members out to a location. We couldn't afford to do it in time otherwise. We wouldn't have been able to. It was an unbelievable blessing that he, here, and if you don't ask for it, with a lot of these people, you'll be surprised as to how generous they are. It applies to every moment of your life, really. This is how we tie it back to you. Think of anyone you've ever been, really been mad with. Uh, your dad, your teacher, maybe your boss, your mom. All people who at those moments in time were in a position of authority over you. It comes down to submitting to authority, sometimes when appropriate. The left wants you to submit to authority when it's the right people, based on identity politics, not based on morality. Whereas, yep, as a Christian, I do believe there's a biblical basis for submitting to authority when appropriate. So all these people, almost all the people you've probably disliked at some moment in your life had authority over you. Now think of anyone on the flip side who's ever actually really helped you and been there when you needed it. Someone who actually meant it. We hear, so, oh, I got your back, bro. Well, what does that mean? What does that mean? Someone who truly meant it when they said they had your back. Could it have been maybe your dad? Maybe that teacher? Maybe that boss? Maybe your mom? Now magnify that. That's just a wealthy person. That's just a big name actor. That's just a person in some kind of position of authority who for some reason you or I or society doesn't like. And because of that, we automatically assume them to be in the wrong. Why? Because we so want them to be in the wrong. That's what's, that's what's wrong with democratic socialism. That's what's wrong with Black Lives Matter, with Antifa, and with the Me Too movement. It's, it's based on so wanting a specific person or group to be wrong that we will do anything. We can almost taste it. And that's the foundation of the left today. The point here is, is really, there's nothing easier than to vilify people in, in positions of power or authority or success that we haven't achieved. Because we haven't achieved it. It's easier to just hate the people who have. Some of them are bad people, of course, but it's even harder to look yourself in the mirror and be honest as to why you hate that person. Is it them? Is it the idea of them? Or is it you? So think of this in your life, if you're listening right now. Is there someone under whose authority, maybe you've been, maybe you've been difficult. Maybe you've been giving them a hard time. Maybe you've been vilifying them. Maybe you're envious of them and you don't treat them so well. Really, I, right now, I'm going to give you a second. I want you to think of one person. This is an exercise. Pick one person in your life. Do you think that person deserves how you treat them? Do you think that person maybe has his or her own crap to deal with? Do you think maybe that person could use someone to really trust? Maybe it's a person with a plane. Point is, it doesn't matter. You've been thinking of you, and we all do this. Make it right. Go today, right now, make it right. Or, or at least, at least make it right moving forward starting today. Because the truth is, there are just as many powerless assholes as there are powerful heroes, and vice versa. It's human nature. I'm not trying to shift the balance of power just for the sake of it. I don't want to restructure society based on envy. All I want to see are more good guys and girls at the top. So you know what? The left wants you to be that guy. Don't be that guy. Don't be the guy or the girl clawing at the guy who you envy. Don't envy. Aspire to be Charles Morse. 
and watch The Edge and tell me it's not underrated. See you next week. We take the time.